Hey everybody, happy Thursday evening Torch tutorial stream. How is everybody doing out there wherever you are? I hope everyone is having a solidly decent day today. Um, it was a lovely and hot day here at, again at Beating Dreams in Dallas. We've definitely reached the oh my god it's a million degrees outside period of summer which we are going to be lingering in for approximately the next six to nine months. Or years. Four years. But hey, at least it stopped raining, right? Welcome to Loop in Loop Chain. Okay, so this is today's project. This is actually a pretty fundamental metalsmithing technique, and it's something that I've been wanting to teach myself for quite a while. So this is my this is my um, prototype, and um, the first thing you probably are noticing here is it's very very stiff. Okay, so um, I made my loop way too small for the gauge of wire that I was using. If I was going to make my loops this small, I should have used probably a 20 gauge, and this is an 18. So the solution to that problem for tonight's tutorial is make bigger loops and you have a much more mobile chain. Also, um, this did not, hi Lori, um, this, tu this uh, not tutorial, this uh, prototype came together so much more slowly than I thought. I basically um, made what I thought was going to be a sufficient amount of loops for a whole bracelet, and it was basically only enough for half. So once again, bigger loops, I tell you, bigger loops. Um, so this is a very fundamental metal smithing technique, and this is the simplest iteration of this technique. Now, if you go down the rabbit hole of loop in loop chain making, there are a ton. So this is a single loop and loop chain. There are double loop and loop chains. There are triple loop and loop chains and um, they can get really intricate and they're really, really beautiful um, and almost look like Viking knit, but this technique actually predates Viking knit. Um, for anybody who's familiar with Viking knit, um, it's where you take a long piece of wire and you essentially, you know, weave it around a dowel and then draw it through a draw plate. It makes a very cool um, kind of meshy um, sort of chain that you can put things on or um, there's all kinds of fun things that you can do with Viking knit. So this technique predates Viking knit because for Viking knit to happen you have to be able to have a significantly long piece of continuously drawn wire and that um, is actually something that um, humans did not achieve um, for quite a while. So the loop and loop chain you make with significantly smaller pieces of wire. So this technique actually predates Viking knit. So let's talk about tools and supplies for this evening's tutorial, all right? The supplies are pretty simple. You're going to need wire, okay? It takes a lot of wire. Um, to make this bracelet, I used approximately six feet of 18 gauge wire. Even if you're using bigger, making bigger loops and making bigger lengths, you're still going to need about the same amount of wire. So about six feet of 18 gauge wire for a bracelet. Uh, you're going to need easy solder. You could also use extra easy. You could also use medium, really, because um, these guys are all going to get soldered individually. So whatever solder you happen to have is actually going to work just fine for this project. Um, easy tends to be my preference when I don't have a reason to pick something else. So that's what I have on the supply list. But really, whatever you have is going to work great. And then if you want to do an actual bracelet, you're going to need a clasp. We're probably not going to get enough chain done during this tutorial to assemble an actual bracelet. So I'll just talk you through how the clasp is put on. It's pretty darn simple. As far as supplies go, of course, it's a soldering tutorial, so there's a fair number of them, though not as many as in some of my soldering tutorials. You're going to need a soldering surface. I've got my solderite board here, which is my favorite soldering surface to use. You are going to need a torch. I've got my blazer butane torch, my favorite torch of all. You are going to need some specialized pliers. You're going to need some bail making pliers. You're going to need two sizes of bail making pliers. You're going to need the big fatties, um, and I'm going to be using this size of my bail making pliers. So for anybody who um, anybody who wants to, oh hey, all of a sudden now my caliper is just working again. Um, anybody who wants to do this using like a dowel instead of a bail making pliers, it's about a three quarters of an inch loop that we're going to be using. Um, that's this bigger, this biggest one is actually technically 0.8 inches there, but um, if you're doing dowels, 0.75 is probably going to be the closest to that. And then you're also going to need these bail making pliers so you can access this loop right here, and or this, not loop, but this part of your pliers right here, and that is probably about 
I'm going to say six or seven millimeters for that. So you're going to need your bale making pliers for this or a couple of dowels that are similarly sized to what I have just told you. You're going to need your basic pliers as well. You're going to need your chain nose pliers. You're going to need your round nose pliers and you're going to need a wire cutter. You probably won't use your round nose pliers actually, but um, it's always good to have them just in case. You're going to need two skinny strong things. So I've got two crochet hooks here. Um, it doesn't matter if they're the same size on the hook end. What I'm going to be using is um, I'm going to be using the round ends, the, the handle ends of them. Um, this is an um, alternative to round nose pliers. I'll show you kind of both ways to do this. Um, I'm, I discovered, like I said, when I made this chain that was a little bit stiff, um, I discovered that my round nose pliers, which I used to stretch my loops, didn't give me quite a round enough loop here, and so that's where a lot of this kind of stiffness and lack of mobility in my chain is coming from. And then, you know, once again, just the fact that it, the wire is a little bit too fat for the size of loops that I created. Um, and then you are going to need a file as well because we are going to be soldering things. That means that we need to flush our ends so that they will solder cleanly. Okay, so I'm going to start by making some circles. So my first chain, my prototype chain, this one here, I used this part of my bail making pliers. I used the second to the smallest and my loops were this size. Ooh, boy, that's really bright there. My loops were this size. It's because my skin is so pale it reflects all of the light ever. So we are going to go a size up from that for tonight's tutorial. So we're going to make our loops using this part of our bail making pliers. Now, as anybody who has been hanging around on the stream for a while or worked with wire for a while knows, what the wire is going to spring up. So if we use this part of our bale making pliers to make our loops, our loops are actually going to be a little bit bigger than that. So the best way to create a series of consistently sized circles is to start with a coil. So I'm going to start with my wire firmly grasped inside my bale making pliers and I'm just going to rotate it around, forming it around this jaw of my pliers to start making a loop. Now at some point I'm going to get to here. I can't make any more loop because if I keep turning it, I'm going to wrap it around the bottom of my pliers, which is going to make a very ugly shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to loosen the pliers, spin them back to my beginning place, grab again, and then make another coil. And what I want to do is I want to try and place each coil beneath the coil that immediately precedes it. So as I'm making my coils, they're progressing off the end of my pliers. That way I'm never going to run out of room. And sorry, once I start actually looking at this instead of trying to look at the screen, um, it's gonna get a lot neater. So I'm gonna go ahead and make about 10 coils. And I had, well, I'll do 11, because I had nine. One, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven. I had seven. All right, then I'm gonna do 13. So I have 20 to total is what I'm going for. Because I did pre, I did preload, and I did um, seven before the stream, just so that we could possibly get a decent length of chain going here, you know, while on stream. So I'm just going to keep coiling this. And notice, like I said, the see, the coils are springing up; they're bigger than that jaw of my bail making pliers, and that's fine. But the the point here is that they're consistently bigger. They're consistently sized coils because even though they spring up, I'm forming them around the same base shape, so they're going to spring up to the same size. So if I'm going to do 13 coils, um, or if I want 13 circles, I need to do about 15 coils because of the cutting. It's going to eat up some of my wire. So where am I now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Six more. Um, and I like coiling. Coiling is, you know, kind of nice and meditative. So this is the same way that you make jump rings, um, except obviously usually jump rings are smaller. They're not always. But anytime you want a series of consistently sized loops, whether they be jump rings or, you know, soldering components or whatever, starting with a coil is always the best way to do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Getting there. So this really does eat up wire very, very quickly. And um, what's really funny is 
a number of the tutorials on loop and loop chain online, you know, start with, you know, it's it's so much more easy and so much, so much, I almost said more easier. That's terrible. It's so much easier and so much more cost effective to make your own chain. And I'm sitting here doing this going, this is laborious. And, and yes, you can get a very beautiful, intricate chain for less money than purchasing it manufactured. But holy cow, does it take a lot of time? which is why we have a bracelet and not a necklace. Um, that being said, it is quite fun. So at some point I may be emboldened to try a double loop and loop chain. We is shall see. Way fun? Um, mm, unclear. You know way fun. <laughs> I, I know way fun, it's true. Okay, so now I've got my coil. So now I'm going to cut. So just a really quick refresher on flush wire cutters, okay? If you've got a flush wire cutter that's a wire cutter that cuts a nominally, nominally, no, nominally, um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna blame Jan Carmen for that one from last night. Nominally, Nom -nom nominally flat edge in your wire, but only one side of your cutter cuts that flush edge, and that's gonna be this flat side here. The side that's notched in like this cuts a pointy edge, which is not what we want because solder will not flow across a gap so we need the ends of this wire to meet flush in order to solder them properly or solder them at all um, and we're going to give ourselves a big leg up on that labor if we use our flush cutters properly so i'm going to take my flush cutters and i'm going to face the flush side towards my coil that i'm cutting and i'm just nipping off this very end then what i'm going to do is i'm going to rotate my cutters 180 degrees line them up with that cut I just made and cut the next coil. And in this particular scenario, this is still the coil that I'm cutting here. At this point, all the rest of this in relation to this coil is waste. So now I've got two flush or nominally flush ends on my wire, and then I have a pointy end on the wire that is left I'm going to show you. There we go. You can see how it's pointy. So you have a pointy end on the wire that's left on the coil. So now I'm going to flip my cutters around and I'm going to flush cut that end. So that really is just literally a nip off of the very end just to flatten that out. And then rotate my cutters 180 degrees, line up, and cut the next coil. So if you do a lot of this, there are ways you can do this that's more efficient than what I'm doing. Um, what most jewelers do is they will actually saw their coils and they'll do this with jump rings as well and um, I don't do enough of this type of work to warrant you know having my saw out all the time so it's way way easier for me to just um, nip it with my wire cutters because I always have those handy but definitely sawing your rings is absolutely a valid way to do this and then they even do make you know tools that um, go on like a flex shaft or a rotary tool where you can make your coil and then you can just kind of essentially stick it in a holder and just saw straight down it um, using your power tool, which is very efficient. Um, my experience with that particular tool is very limited. Uh, I had one client a while back who um, had one and I remember her having absolutely a dickens of a time trying to figure out how to use it. So I think it's one of those tools where once you figure it out, it's fantastic, but until then, um, it's a little bit mystifying and I personally am just, it's just easier for me to bust out my wire cutters. Again, that's just me. All right, so I'm just continuing to cut these coils and let's see how many I end up with. It doesn't really matter at this point. I'm going to end up with however many I'm going to end up with. I'm not making any more coils. coils with my flush cutter it only cuts like I said a nominally flush end um, I'm sorry I have my I've got my focal distance set for my soldering board but there's a burr right there in the center of your wire you got to get rid of that in order to have a flush edge to solder this is where your file comes in 
If you've got a nice sharp file, it shouldn't take more than a couple of strokes to just flatten that out. So now I've got a really flat end on my wire and I'm gonna do the same on the other side. And then I'm gonna go ahead and tension fit this so that my ends of my wire will hold closed against each other without me having to hold them. And so then I'm just going to file and tension fit every one of these. <laughs> awesome. It is. I mean, this part, this part is not any different than anything that we've done before. Um, it's literally just soldering circles. So, I mean, it's the same as soldering earring components. It's the same as soldering a bangle bracelet. It's you know, the same as soldering any closed shape. And you actually can, you know, the assembly of this bracelet doesn't actually take any, any sharp or, or flamey tools. So this would also be kind of a fun project if you wanted to pre-solder all of the links. You could actually, you know, assemble this, once again, now that traveling is a thing again, you could actually assemble this on like an airplane or something of that nature. So I'm going to continue filing and tension fitting these until all 15 are done. And while I'm doing that, I just want to talk a little bit about what's upcoming on the Beating Dreams stream tomorrow. You will not find us on Twitch. You will not find us on Facebook. Tomorrow is our Zoom Crafty Cocktail Hour. That means you will find us on Zoom. It's the Wednesday every two weeks that I actually get to see all of your faces, which is very exciting. And um, if you've Zoomed with us before, it's the same uh, credentials as the last time, if you've not Zoomed with us before and you'd like that meeting information, just go ahead and email us, beatingdreamsdallas at gmail.com, and I will send you all the meeting info. We usually kick off around 6 p.m. Central Time, just like our um, tutorial streams do, and we'll run until about 8 p.m. Central Time. Um, there will not be a project taught. It is free open crafting time for you to work on whatever you want, and it's a really great time if you need to get a little bit of help on anything um, Heather and I will both be on to give um, help and feedback on any projects that you might be having issues with and um, of course if you need opinions there is a whole group of folks who are usually eager and happy to give their opinions so once again tomorrow night at 6 p.m. we will be on zoom with our zoom crafty cocktail hour we do that once every two weeks um, and then we'll be back on the beating dream stream twitch.tv forward slash beating dream on Saturday with our Weeping Willow Pendant. Um, so this is just a variation on our Tree of Life Pendant. For anybody who's made that before, you can probably see the similarities, but we are using some pieces of chain to give this a really cool kind of um, Weeping Willow effect. So I'm very excited about that. And that one is, uh, that's not a soldering tutorial, though you could solder a circle for your tree to live in if you wanted to, but it's just, that one's just a, wire wrapping tutorial and we've got fun stuff upcoming for you all next week on the beating dream stream i did finish all of my samples for next week so we've got a fun ring with a faceted brilliant cut stone uh, most of the things we do around here with fabrication tend to be with like cabochons and rose cuts so we do actually have a ring with a brilliant cut stone i'm very excited about that we've got a fun sheet metal um, assembled sheet metal necklace coming up for you guys we have um, a cool little charm bracelet for our Thursday noon stream project and a fun pair of earrings because of course it's not a beating dreams week without earrings of some sort because we like our earrings here at the beating dreams do in fact okay so I've got five more to go including the one in my hand so um, I will say that if you do a lot of soldering it is so worth it to invest in a good file, okay? For years, I um, just kind of went with the little, you know, El Cheapo needle files, and I was like, it's fine, you know, whatever. Like, you're only, you know, the, the tool's only as good as the craftsperson who uses it. Like, if, if you're having filing problems, it's not because of your file, it's, you know, because of you, which is, you know, true to some extent, but I will say that when I first got my hands on uh, an actual nice sharp Swiss file, life changing. Seriously, it cuts your filing time in half if your technique is good. Like if you're if you're not solid on your filing technique, it doesn't matter what file you have, it's still gonna suck. 
but um, and by suck I mean the experience of it is going to be difficult and frustrating the only way you get past that is to keep doing it and doing it and doing it until eventually you learn you know how much pressure what angle you need to file at in order to make your joints work and at that point then it, you know it becomes pretty easy peasy lemon squeezy and then when you take that level of skill and you add you know an actually really nice tool onto it this is where you really can start making some good headway as far as efficiency and things taking you know more reasonable amounts of time now that being said anytime you're like i'm going to assemble a chain from scratch like you're in for a project because assembling a chain from scratch no matter what kind of chain it is takes time a boatload of time typically for some chains it's only a small dinghy's worth of time but okay it's other chains are a barge other chains are a barge it's true okay so here we go now with the soldering so let me set up my soldering station all right so now each one of these is just going to get soldered at the joint and so I'm going to lay these all out and I'm going to put some of them on camera and I'm going to put some of them off camera and I'm going to try and just kind of wham bam solder them all um, in sequence. But there's a couple that I'll do first so you can see what is going on. And whenever I'm doing something like this large batch soldering what I'll try and do is I will try and put the joints all at the same position whether that be 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, or apparently for me tonight, it's like 4.45, whatever. Um, just putting them all in the same place sort of helps me know where to put my solder. And I don't have to, I don't have to, you know, think about it as much. So I've got my whole little forest of circles on my solder board. And the other thing that I will say about this is don't use too much solder. It's really easy to over apply solder on these and you wind up with, I can show you exactly what you wind up with because I did it on all of the ones I did pre-stream, is you wind up with these really not so attractive large blobby solder joints. Okay, That's because I used way more solder than I needed to to close that joint. So I have 15 pieces here. I'm going to cut 15 pieces of solder. Seriously, tiny little snippets, okay? That's like a millimeter, if that. And I'm just going to put them down here on my workstation. So 15, two. And if you use a solder cutting pliers, um, you actually want about half that size for this. So if you use a solder cutting pliers, typically um, use your wire cutters for this because you can cut smaller pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Could I have pre-cut these? Of course I could have. Did I? No, of course I didn't. <laughs> 13, 14, I might have cut an extra one there, but that's totally fine. Okay, something I neglected to put on the tools list, but something that you should always have handy when you're soldering is a tweezers. Why is that, you say? Because hot things. So now I'm going to take my flux. So let's talk about, oh, I didn't actually say that flux. Hey, it's on the list though. Um, so let's take a second and talk about what flux is and what it does. And while I'm talking about what flux is and what it does, I'm just going to take my flux, which is kind of this white pasty substance, and I'm going to paint it on each of my joints. So what flux is, is it is this, this white pasty substance that I have in this jar here. And what it does is it protects your metal from oxidation. So when you hit a metal that is either base metal or has a base metal component to it with a torch, first thing that's going to happen is that metal is going to oxidize, it's going to turn black. The problem with that, of course, is that your solder can't throw, throw, flow through that oxide layer, and so you literally can't solder if your metal is oxidized, your solder will not flow. So what the flux does is it protects the metal from that oxide and allows you to actually successfully solder. So now that I've applied that flux to each of my joints, I'm going to take a little chip of solder and I'm going to place it directly underneath the joint on each of my 
pieces. Okay, so that's my solder piece. My join is right there. That's where I'm going to solder. So this is going to take a minute. Um, this is one of those, you know, prep work is no fun. Nobody likes placing solder. Nobody likes filing. You know, the, the fun is when you, when you see the thing coming together and all of these preliminary steps aren't necessarily the most gratifying, but I will tell you that if you are diligent with your prep, if you do a good job of prepping, your soldering is going to go so much easier. The chances that you are going to create some kind of critical error or, you know, melt something that you don't want to melt is significantly lessened by prep work that is done properly and meticulously. Okay, so um, as I am positioning solder on these, I'm going to talk to you for just a moment about safety. Um, and I do want to remind everyone, of course, that I have no actual credentials as far as safety goes. Um, I'm really just some random person on the internet. There's no real reason you should listen to me about anything. But I have been teaching soldering for over 10 years now, and there are a few things that tend to consistently come up as far as having a safe workspace in your own home and as far as maintaining um, safe work protocols when you're using a community workspace. So, number one, try your best. And by try your best, I mean absolutely 100% do as I say, not as I do. Keep six to eight inches of clear space between your soldering station and anything around you that is either flammable or meltable. Flammable meaning, of course, that it can get set on fire. Meltable meaning that it can turn from a solid to a liquid state with the application of heat. Um, and here's a fun thing is a lot of plastic things are actually both. Once they've melted, then they can catch on fire. Not the kind of excitement you really want in your soldering space. So as long as you keep six to eight inches of clear space around your workstation at all times, the chances of you accidentally um, melting or setting something on fire are significantly lessened because if you're using a butane torch like I am, it's not a very big flame. It doesn't have a very long reach. And so you just have to, you know, keep everything just barely out of its reach and everything is going to be absolutely fine. Number two, once you have had a torch going in your workspace from that point forward, always assume that everything in your workspace is hot enough to burn you because most of the things in your workspace are, even if they don't look it. This is where tweezers come in handy, okay? If you want to pick something up and there's a chance it might be hot, just don't pick it up with your bare hands. Use your tweezers. Trust me, your little fingies will thank you. Thank you, fingies. Well, if you use your tweezers, they won't be angry fingies, so they'd be happy fingies, which is the kind that we like. Yeah. Number three, ventilation is important, okay? So if you find that you are hacking, coughing, wheezing, or feeling otherwise uncomfortable in the lung area after you've been soldering, you may want to re-examine your ventilation situation. You may need to move by the window. You may need to move outside, okay? Not everybody is comfortable, or not everybody's body is comfortable with the same soldering condition, so definitely... You know, listen to your body. If it's telling you that something needs to change, then something needs to change. Um, number four, if you're not actively soldering with your torch, turn it off. These torches are very easy to ignite. They're very easy to extinguish. There's absolutely no reason to keep it burning when you are not actively using it. And number five, if you're doing this in your own home, you need to make sure that you have a fire extinguisher within arm's reach. If you're doing it in a community workspace, you need to make sure you know where the fire extinguisher is because usually if you need a fire extinguisher, you need it right now, not 15 minutes later after you ask five people where the fire extinguisher is. So that's your five point soldering safety lecture. Of course, if you're doing this in your own home, you know, consult actual experts on your workspace. If you're working in a community workspace, follow the guidelines provided by your community workspace. Um, even though sometimes they seem like a pain in the neck, they really are there to keep everyone and everything safe. So now that we know all about being safe, let's go ahead and solder some things. So I've got all of my solder position. I'm going to light my torch and this should go pretty easily. I'm going to put my pick in my right hand just in case I need to poke anything. But the way that this should work is I'm just going to heat my whole circle. Once my flux turns clear, I'm going to focus on that joint until my solder just flows up and into that joint and joins the two sides of my circle like so. So we're going to watch that one more time on this one. We're going to heat the whole thing. 
Once that flux turns clear, so you can see that white's going away, that's the flux turning clear. Okay, and this is one of the reasons I like putting my solder underneath is because you have a really good visual indicator of when your solder is flowed because your piece will actually um, physically sink down. Okay, so you may have seen that one in the background. Sink down because the, the solder turns liquid. All right, so now we're just going to go and solder all of these together. So again, this is just basic soldering. There's nothing about the soldering part of this that is new or exciting to anybody who's, who's familiar with basic fabrication and has done simple soldering you know, of wire shapes before. This is all very standard and um, similar to what you already know. And by similar, I mean exactly the same. You do want to make sure you get a good solid joint, so make sure you put enough heat in there that not only does your solder flow, but it actually joins the two sides of your piece together. And I realize that I'm probably soldering off camera, so you can just trust that I'm doing cool stuff. Always. Well, not always, but most of the time. Still going with home. I'm confident. Well, at least one of us is. All right, last one. All right, there we go. Okay, so now all theoretically, all 15 of my circles are soldered together. Now I need to let them cool down before I'm going to be able to handle them. So, um, oops, I forgot one. See this one there? That one right there. I totally skipped him or her or them. Pretty sure the circles are gender neutral. There we go. Okay, so where I'm allowing these to cool, I want to get them off of my soldering surface and onto some other surface. Now the actual best surface for these to set on to cool is a steel bench block because the steel bench block will actually leach some of the heat out of them and help them to cool down more quickly. But the reason I want to get them off my soldering surface is because soldering surfaces generally are designed to absorb heat and reflect it back at your work. That makes it easier to get everything up to temperature and to successfully solder it. So um, that's great if you're soldering, but if you're trying to get something to cool down, having it on a hot surface is not the best way to accomplish that. So I'm going to give these guys just a minute to cool down. Now, if I had um, a little cup of quench water, I could totally just dump them all in the quench water and they would be instantaneously cool enough to touch. All right, so now this is my solder loop. Okay, and they all look pretty much like this. They don't have to be perfectly round at this point because we're about to stretch them. So there's two ways to stretch them. And the way that um, is most commonly seen on tutorials is to use your round nose pliers. So to do that, I'm just gonna take my round nose, I'm gonna put them inside of my loop. And what I'm doing is I'm expanding my round nose so that they are resting against the sides of my loop. And I'm going to, there we go. And then I'm just gonna pull on either side of my round nose until they, All right, until they pull my loop open. So you can see I'm having a little bit of trouble with this because of the size of my loop. My pliers keep slipping. So this is definitely better to do with the smaller size loop. What I discovered works better for these larger loops is this, two crochet hooks. And we have done this before on certain you know, other projects. I'm just gonna take my two crochet hooks, one on either side of that loop, and I'm gonna pull them away from each other. And I'm gonna pull them very strongly away from each other. Okay, I'm pulling literally as hard as I can. And then I'm just gonna twist them. And what that twisting and pulling is going to do is it's going to elongate our circle into something that looks like this. Okay, so that is the goal here. And you can see I, I even used a little bit too much solder on that one. Oh well, 
So again, we're gonna pull firmly away from each other, and then we're gonna pull and twist. And that's going to, once again, elongate into this nice, long ovoid shape. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that with all of my pieces. So once again, I got 15 loops here that I made and soldered. These are 18 gauge wire. And the total project, if you're gonna make a bracelet, takes about six feet of wire to make. Um, and that's almost regardless of the size of loop that you do because um, as you, if you're making bigger loops, you're gonna need fewer loops, but each loop itself takes more wire. It is kind of a paperclip shape without the, um, you know, without all the inside swirly bits that an actual functional paperclip has. I have inside swirly bits too. That's true, but you are also not a paperclip. It's true. I'm too tall. Though that, um, every time somebody mentions paperclips, it still, it reminds me of Clippy. Does everybody remember Clippy, the absolutely useless and totally annoying um, virtual assistant from Microsoft Word in um, the early 2000s, I think it was? Um, <sighs> yep. Oh, Clippy, you were never helpful. No, but I always used Clippy at work just because work at that point where I worked was so boring <laughs> that... So what you're saying is Clippy was your friend. <laughs> Clippy was my friend. <laughs> I was allowed to change my screensaver, and I could change the shape of Clippy because he had different right. iterations. So. Okay, so if you have a big bubbly bump of solder like that, um, you can sort of mitigate that a bit by using your chain nose pliers and just kind of smashing it flat. It's not going to get rid of the lump of solder, but it is going to at least help kind of normalize the shape of that oval. So I'm just continuing on with the paper clipping with the clipping of my of my circles. So this is why it doesn't matter so much that they are perfect circles um, by the time you're done soldering them because we're changing their shape anyway. Um, but it's nice to start with them as circles because that way you can be pretty sure that the sizing is consistent. Three more to go. So once again, don't be like me, learn from my mistakes, make bigger circles the first couple times you do this because the assembly is so much easier if your circles are um, larger, like the ones that I have made, which I think are about an inch in diameter with the spring up and everything versus the, the ones that I did for my prototype, which are closer to three quarters of an inch. Like it doesn't, doesn't seem like that quarter of an inch would make as much of a difference as it does, but trust me, it's huge so much easier to assemble the bigger links. Okay, so now I have clippified or elongated all of my links. So they're all this kind of, you know, long, skinny oval shape. Then I'm going to find the middle of each link and with my pliers, I'm just going to pinch that closed. So it looks kind of like a bow tie and it's not going to go all the way closed. You are going to wind up with a little gap there. That's okay. So now I'm going to bow tie, not to be confused with Botox, that's something different. Yes. All of my links. So I'm just taking my pliers and I am squeezing, once again, in the center of each link. Um, you could measure it if you want to, I'm just eyeballing it. We all know that doesn't always work out great for me, but it, it worked out pretty good on this piece of chain that I made before the stream. So we're gonna we're just gonna go with the eyeballing. But yes, if you wanted to, you absolutely could just measure the length of each link and then mark mark the center with a sharpie. Absolutely a great thing to do. Now you may have noticed that I did not pickle these links. Okay, so they're kind of ugly looking, full of oxide and they're full of flux residue and that's because after I assemble this chain I'm just going to throw the whole thing in the tumbler. Okay so tumbler for anybody who is not familiar with that it is literally the same machine that you may have had as a kid to tumble rocks. The difference in it being set up to polish metal versus being set up to tumble rocks is that instead of having grit basically sand and liquid in your tumbler you have metal shot uh, basically metal BBs 
and soap and the action of the metal shot banging against your piece of metal will actually shine it and polish it and make it, you know, turn it from this state, you know, which is freshly soldered and, and kind of gross looking to this state, which is very shiny, shiny silver and very pretty. So I am just going to take my finished chain and I'm going to throw it in the tumbler. Now, if I didn't have a tumbler, I would want to take some steel wool to these links before I assemble them because once you assemble it, it's really almost impossible to get all of like the, the insides with your steel wool. So if you if steel wool is your thing, if you don't have a tumbler, don't have access to a tumbler, you're going to want to steel wool all of your links at this point. Okay, and before you steel wool them, you're going to want to pickle them. So pickle, for anybody who's not familiar with that, is a weak acid solution. And what it does is it'll clean all of this oxide, all this yellow and black stuff off of your pieces and then you can hit them with some steel wool, um, some triple zero or quadruple zero, zero steel wool. You can get a nice satiny silver finish on there. Um, but if you have a tumbler and you have some time, that is an exponentially easier way to finish your pieces because you don't have to pickle. You can go straight from um, your final soldering on into your tumbler and you'll still end up with something that is pretty and shiny like this one here. So now that I have bow tied all of my pieces, now I'm going to bend them. So this is where we're going to use our um, smaller bail making pliers. And I'm going to use this middle section. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take each of my little, little bow ties and I'm going to grab right on the little bow tie part and I'm just going to bend those two ends up to make something that looks like this. Okay, so now we've got kind of a, a double bent horseshoe thing going on with our links. So now we're going to go ahead and horseshoe. So we did, we did paper clip and then we did bow tie and then we did horseshoe. No, those are not official terms. That is, that is beating dreams stream terminology. But, you know, sometimes it helps to have silly little names for things because it makes them easier to remember. Like a lady with a scarf. Exactly, like a lady with a scarf. And so all of your links should be relatively uniform in size because we started with uniformly sized circles. Once again, I'm just bending each and every one of these into a little horseshoe shape. And I want to make sure that, that it's even. So if I'm coming over... And I see that my ends are getting uneven like that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to push a little bit more on the longer end to line it back up with the shorter end. So what you want is you do want your ends to be even, which mine are not because I was trying to do that while I'm looking at the screen instead of the actual project. Hazards of streaming. So again, just bend. And since we've soldered these, they should be pretty soft because they've been basically annealed by the heat, so it should not be a huge chore to bend these. Now, let's talk for a second about metals. Um, so I'm using sterling silver, which is a great metal to fabricate with. If you're looking for something less expensive, my recommendation would be copper for your, your beginning you know, work on things like chains and such. You can also do brass and bronze. Uh, the thing that you need to remember if you're doing brass and bronze, as some of you who have seen some brass and bronze projects on the Beating Dream stream will remember, is that if you solder with brass or bronze, you're going to wind up with a depletion gilded layer of copper on the surface of your piece, and you need to chemically strip that piece, oh, or sorry, that layer away from your piece in order to get back to the native yellow color of the metal. So there's just an intermediary chemical step in there called super pickle. Super pickle is one part white vinegar, one part hydrogen peroxide, and you just uh, mix that one to one, take your um, piece, put it in your regular pickle to clean off all of your gunk and gook, and then place it into your super pickle to clean off that, that layer of depletion gilding, and then you just proceed as normal. Though I will say that there's a fair amount of effort in putting together uh, a chain like this, so, you know, I see spring for the sterling. Because it is a fairly elementary technique, it's difficult to screw it up. Now, that being said, you know, you can watch me screw it up on stream, um, but, yes, uh, 
you know, the cool thing, okay, so what I'm doing is I'm going to take apart this chain that I assembled um, before stream so that I can show you from the beginning how to put this together. And um, so I've got all of these individual links, and that's the other cool thing about this, is if I decide I want to repurpose this chain somehow, I can definitely, I can absolutely 100% you know, take this apart and, and, you know, rearrange it in some other fashion. Okay, so here's how this goes together. And this is the part that took me the longest to internalize. Okay, so I've got two links. Okay, so these are two links. I'm looking at their, the horseshoe. So they generally have a wider loop. That was where we went around the bale making pliers. And then they have a narrower loop. That's where it went around the crochet hooks. Okay, so I'm going to have one with the wide loop up, and I'm going to have one with the narrow loop up, okay? I'm going to take the narrow loop one, and I'm going to insert it through the two narrow loops of the one in my hand, and then I'm just going to rotate this like so. So now you should have horseshoe sides facing the same way and narrow sides facing the same way, okay? And so this is the thing that you kind of need to, to keep track of is sometimes it's easy to get switched around and all of a sudden it's going a different way. So once again, all right, I'm taking my existing chain. I've got the horseshoe side facing up. So this link now I can completely ignore. It's on there, don't need to do anything to it. Horseshoe link is facing up. Skinny link is facing up on this one. I'm just gonna go through the two ends, the two skinny ends of my horseshoe and then just rotate it up. Now I can ignore these two links. I'm go to my next one. So horseshoe side up, skinny link goes through both of those and then just rotate it up. Again, this is exponentially easier with these bigger loops than it was with the little loops that I used on my prototype. So again, horseshoe side up, skinny side, so I'm only taking one of these skinny links and putting it through there. So it's going through like that. So one up, one down, and then you're just gonna rotate it like so. And once you get the hang of it, it's actually kind of fun because it's, it's just like a little puzzle going together. And you'll make sure that you get through both of those and then just rotate. So again, it's, it's skinny, skinny one way, crossing through skinny the other way, and then just rotating up. If you are doing this with a smaller link, um, you may need to use a pliers to help you with this rotation. I know on my prototype, I definitely did. Just through, rotate. And this is actually, okay, so I almost did that wrong. I almost put the, the fat side through, um, so I need to make sure I'm putting the skinny loop through the two skinny loops and then rotate. And again, this was the part on the YouTube tutorial that I was kind of using to just um, solidify my techniques, techniques, techniques in this. Um, I definitely had to go back and watch the assembly of the chain many times to get it. Okay, so I actually am I've made a bracelet, and I've made a bracelet, and I've got six extra links. So definitely a fan of the larger loop, larger link. It's a much more mobile chain, and it was so much easier to make. Oh my gosh, so much easier to make. So at this point, I actually can, if I want, I can stop putting links on, and I can put my clasp on. And I'm gonna use a sterling silver clasp so it can go in the tumbler um, just like the rest of my bracelet. So I don't need to worry about messing up my bracelet with um, with the clasp in the tumbler. So I'm just gonna use the same clasp. I'm gonna pull the clasp off of my prototype bracelet. It's just a sterling silver toggle clasp. And I'm just gonna attach it with two jump rings. I, could I solder these jump rings closed? Absolutely. Um, am I gonna solder these jump rings closed? No, I am not. Uh, and the key to that, of course, is just make sure you use a decently heavy jump ring. So I've got um, 
this is actually an 18 gauge jump ring. The other, my smaller one's a 20 gauge jump ring. So as long as you're using decently heavy jump rings, you don't need to worry so much about them being soldered in order to be sturdy because a heavy jump ring is just sturdy because it's sturdy. So on one end, I'm going to take my jump ring and I'm gonna go through the two loops on my chain. So I've got, it's not my horseshoe end, it's my skinny end. And then I'm gonna drop half of my toggle onto that loop. And then if I had another chain nose, I'd use that, but I don't, so I'm gonna use a round nose. And I'm just gonna close that all the way. And then on the other side, my ring's gonna go around here. So I'm using a slightly smaller ring on this side because I don't have to span quite as much of a distance. I'm just gonna go around that end, drop my toggle clasp on, and close it up. You don't have to use a toggle clasp. You can use whatever clasp you want. You can use a hook and eye. You can use a lobster claw. You can make your own clasp. Um, I've already got my fabrication tutorial set for the next uh, three weeks, but possibly after that, we'll have a fabricated clasps class because it's kind of fun to be able to know how to make your own clasps. But there we go. That is our, that's our single loop and loop chain. And we did actually manage a whole bracelet. Now this is a little bit big for me. So if I wanted to adjust that, say I was selling this to a client and I, I wanted to make it smaller, um, I would go from this end. Okay. So it's always the end where, where the horseshoe is opening um, outwards. And I would just remove this jump ring. And this is another nice reason not to have this soldered is it makes it a little more easily adjustable. And then I can literally just back out one or two links to make it the size that I want it and then put my clasp back on. And then once your clasp is on there, your links can't come undone. Once that jump ring's on there, it's blocking the egress for that ring so you don't have to worry about, you know, your chain just falling apart as you're walking down the street. So there we go, that's it. That's our single loop and loop chain. Very happy with the way that turned out. Um, with my nice sterling silver toggle. So I'm gonna go and um, throw this into my tumbler overnight tonight and by tomorrow it's gonna be all nice and shiny. So I will show it off on the Zoom tomorrow and probably on the tutorial on Saturday as well because I know there are probably some of you who aren't gonna make it to the Zoom. So that's it, that's our Torch Thursday stream. Thanks, Lori. So for anybody out there who doesn't know me, I'm Allison from Beating Dreams in Dallas, Texas. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for taking some time out of your Thursday night to learn how to make single loop in loop chain. Um, we are, for anybody who doesn't know us, an actual brick and mortar retail bead store. That means we do have actual premises. See, now I can't stop putting these together. We have actual premises here in Dallas, Texas. So if you are local in Dallas, um, we are here to feed your need to bead six days a week. We're here Monday through Saturday from 1 p.m. until 6 p.m. Um, <laughs> have a great dinner, Lori. Thank you so much for hanging out. Um, but if you're not local in Dallas, you can find us on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beading dream five times a week with complimentary tutorials. We do stream Wednesday through Saturday at 6 p.m. Central time because we are here in Dallas, Texas, and um, we do a bonus tutorial stream Thursdays at noon, um, which we did today. We did a fun little um, knotted bracelet thurs um, today at noon. However, don't forget, tomorrow night, Friday, is our Zoom Crafty Cocktail Hour. That means you will not find us on Facebook. You will not find us on Twitch. You will find us on Zoom, crafting and probably drinking and having a good time. So hopefully we'll see some of you on that Zoom. If you Zoomed with us before, it's the same credentials as last time. If you've not Zoomed with us before, email us, beatingdreamsdallas at gmail.com, and we'll send you that meeting info. So I think that's it for Heather and I this Thursday evening. Everyone have a fantastic rest of your Thursday night. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful, wonderful evening and a great day tomorrow. Hopefully, like I said, I will see some of you all on Zoom. For anybody that I'm not going to see on Zoom tomorrow, don't forget, we'll be back on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dream on Saturday at 6 p.m. with this project. This is our Weeping Willow Pendant Project. That's going to be um, immediately preceding our Saturday live merchandise sales stream, um, which is always guaranteed to be fun and full of shenanigans. So everyone have a wonderful evening. Have a great day tomorrow. And um, we will see you all back on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dream very, very soon.